Now I'm just going to make sure I've got this correct. Yeah. Okay. So I'm actually, I mean, obviously the aim of this session is to discuss uh, successes and challenges into translating, translating evidence into policies and programs. But actually what I'm going to talk about is a new program of work in Australia to improve vaccine acceptance and uptake of both maternal and childhood vaccines that's in development and how we are trying to conceptualise the program and plan for research translation right from the very start by engaging the end users and government and um, broadly collaborating. So at this point, we really, I'm going to be underlining more of the challenges and the program in development, not so much the successes yet. Hopefully at a future conference here at ANSI, I'll be uh, outlining the successes of this program. But I really do want to highlight the importance of both local collaboration in building programs and international collaboration, which has been really key to the development of this program and understanding the needs of public health officials and really also being very mindful of vaccine policy right from the start. And I feel very passionate about this and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so really focusing on translation right from the start. So, I mean, you know, we know that there's a substantial investment into ensuring that vaccines are safe and that they work. Um, and I think at this point we all agree um, that it's time to make the same investment to actually make sure that um, in, in the case of this uh, program that pregnant women and children are actually getting them and that the vaccine policies that are um, introduced to support uptake are actually fair and equitable and effective. Actually in Australia, just in the last few months, the government has announced a $5.5 million program called Get the Facts Immunisation Campaign which is all about more resources, more information, a really glossy website, some really lovely videos on, on narratives and, and patient stories. But again, there's nothing about the website or, the, in, or the, the resources that is actually looking at how it will be used, how parents will access it and how it'll actually be translated or used in the community. And I find this so frustrating that governments do this. You know, five and a half million dollars is a lot of money. And really, when I think what, how that could be better spent in terms of developing interventions that we've all been talking about that I'll outline today, that are looking at both using communication approaches with providing education, and then, you know, it's all spent on a very glossy website. So, of course, it's welcome in the Australian setting, and we do have an issue with vaccine hesitancy, as I'll talk about. But, you know, um, I don't need to tell this audience that we really need interventions that show an improvement in uptake now. So just very briefly about the <clears throat> Australian setting in terms of vaccine coverage. At the moment, our sort of, we measure immunisation coverage at three time points, at the 12 month, 18 month and four year old time point. And generally, at, we have high vaccine coverage. It's around about 92% are fully vaccinated. But of course, there's a persistent gap, and we know that that's due to a lack of opportunity, and this is Angus and Evs and others, um, you know, the, the five A's. So about 4.75%, we believe, is uh, uh, the um, gap in under vaccination is due to access issues. And more recently, we've estimated that around about 3.3% is due to either registered or non-registered vaccine objection. But of course this varies dramatically regionally and we have some areas where the, the percent fully vaccinated is way down at 51%. There's an area, um, a particular hotspot, a particular community where it's extremely low. But even in every city, in every region, there are pockets where the immunisation coverage is sitting way down in the 80s. <clears throat> So we know that vaccine acceptance is on a spectrum, and this is really using Julie Leesk's vaccine communication framework with the five uh, categories of parents, starting from accepting all the way down, going through cautiously accepting, hesitant, a delay or selective vaccinator to declining. And we've done a lot of work using the, the VCF, or the vaccine communication framework, trying to understand what proportion of Australian parents have concerns and what those concerns are, because obviously that's going to inform our intervention development. So we roughly estimate that 
between about half of parents don't have any concerns about vaccination and any concerns or minor concerns in about a third and that more highly hesitant group there um, to the to the far right that from the hesitant to the refusing we estimate to be between eight to twelve percent of parents so obviously that's a, a greater proportion of parents than that 3.3 percent that identify as um, registered or, or, or unregistered objection and consistently, not surprisingly, the concerns are centred around vaccine safety. The top concern is too many vaccines given in the first two years of life. About 25% or a quarter of parents have that concern in, in the parents we've surveyed. And that's been in general paediatric outpatients, maternal and child healthcare centres and antenatal settings. It's pretty consistent across all of those environments. Uh, vaccine ingredients, weakening of the immune system, and of course the persistent concern about MMR and autism is still held by 10% of Australian parents. So uh, the policies that um, we discussed yesterday, I won't go into them in great details, and, and Katie gave a fantastic um, overview of, of, of mandates. This is a big issue in Australia at the moment, the no jab, no pay policy, which was brought in at the start of 2016, essentially has um, removed conscientious objection, so no philosophical or religious exemptions to access family assistance payments that I've put there. And for some families that equates to $15,000 a year, which is a lot of money if you're already disadvantaged and struggling. <clears throat> and no jab, no play, in access, so you have to be fully immunised to access early childhood, early childcare services or kindergarten is actually only in our state, but the government's looking to roll that out further. And Julie Leesk and I and others have been very vocal uh, critics, and I think I firmly believe that vaccine mandates have a role, but that there should be hard to reach exemptions maintained, that there should be equity, um, uh, and that you know, only um, you know, lower SES or, or disadvantaged parents should not be the ones targeted predominantly by these policies. And I raise this now just because I think this is very important again in terms of developing interventions. Um, they, uh, you know, if we can support and, and, and improve uptake with effective interventions, then hopefully the, the need to make mandates so extreme will not be so pressing in the minds of government. <clears throat> So in terms of our pilot work, what we have been able to show are a few key points that have informed the intervention that I'm going to describe to you. And that is predominantly that pregnancy is a key vaccine decision making time point. We showed that first time mothers are definitely more undecided and more vaccine hesitant than mothers with children. We've shown that flu and, and pertussis or whooping cough vaccine uptake in pregnancy remains low. And of course, not surprisingly, there's a strong correlation between clinician recommendation and receipt of maternal vaccines. Um, and we also showed that concerns about childhood vaccines in pregnancy correlate with uptake post-delivery. So that's very important in terms of designing interventions. In our setting in Australia, we've shown that the midwife in the public antenatal setting are the most frequently accessed and trusted resource for mothers. Um, and we've also shown, of course, that lack of availability of maternal vaccines in the antenatal setting is a key barrier to their receipt. So I'll just briefly outline some of the data behind this pilot work. We, as I said, we showed 73% of first-time mothers had made a decision regarding their uh, vaccinating their child after delivery compared to 89% um, of mums with kids. And what I want to highlight here is that um, of first-time mothers pregnant, 40% um, had some concerns about vaccination compared to only 33% of mums with children. And you can see here 5.3% of first-time mothers were highly hesitant about vaccinating compared to 1.7%. And altogether, nearly 9% uh, of first-time mothers were in those top three VCF categories compared to 4.9% of mothers with children. So, you know, we've clearly shown that first-time mothers have concerns about vaccines. This is the first time that they're starting to think about vaccination. It's overwhelming, it's frightening, and this is the time we need to get in early. And Arnold and I have talked about this, you know, he's accessing mums on the uh, post, you know, very soon after delivery on the maternity ward. I, I'm arguing that we should get in earlier. We need to be talking to these mums from the first trimester of pregnancy, especially first time mothers. Uh, just very briefly, this is our uptake data for maternal vaccines in pregnancy. So we showed 82% overall of mums that had a whooping cough vaccine. 
only 46% had had a flu vaccine. And really pleasingly, I do think, we 60% of partners, so um, fathers had had a, a, mostly fathers, but it could be mothers as well, had had a, a pertussis vaccine. And that's funded now in Australia for the partner to have a free uh, pertussis vaccine. <clears throat> We showed in our study that 11% of the babies um, three to six months after delivery weren't up to date. So that, again, you know, is in contrast to what I showed you earlier about that 8% roughly. So we showed 11% were not up to date. Um, so it does differ um, substantially in, in different regions, different areas. Um, and then these are, this is what I was referring to about vaccine uptake correlating with concerns that the mothers held in pregnancy. So of mums who identified to being highly hesitant, their kids after delivery were definitely less likely to be up to date compared to mothers who had no concerns. And there's the vaccine safety. So mothers that, that I'd said that vaccines um, are not safe for my child in pregnancy, their child was um, less likely to be vaccinated post delivery. Uh, so I think it's important to have this data to support why we're doing what we're doing. Um, we showed that there was no association, interestingly, between childhood vaccine uptake and maternal vaccine uptake, which surprised me a little bit. Um, and we showed, of course, that a recommendation for a maternal vaccine in pregnancy was one of the key factors to the mother actually having a pertussis or a flu vaccine. So the intervention. Clearly, the, the pilot work has outlined um, the key areas, the key points that we need to target. Um, so we want to develop a, um, a, a tailored approach to improving vaccine uptake of both childhood and maternal vaccines in pregnancy. And we really predominantly want to target the midwives, uh, but also um, the obstetricians. Just briefly touching on the behaviour change wheel as um, uh, a framework that can inform interventions, I'm really thinking of this um, intervention, you know, from a socio-ecological model um, point of view, where we're looking at the individual organisational and policy levels, and we're incorporating both structural levers as well as di dialogue-based uh, interventions. Um, so it's a real multi-component intervention. And this is the behaviour change Will um, by Michi, um, that really you can see the sources of behaviour, capability, opportunity, motivation, informing intervention functions. And you can see they're clearly looking at education, persuasion, a lot of what we were talking about yesterday versus restrictions, and then how that in can inform and interact with policy categories. So the intervention um, that we're developing, we've called Mum Bubvax, very Australian, I'm told. Obviously, an intervention for mothers, children, and, and children, uh, childhood vaccines. Um, and obviously, the first step, I'll outline what the intervention's going to look like, but the first step is going to be to conduct a pilot study to assess feasibility and acceptability by mothers and providers. Um, this intervention package is going to be targeted at three levels, so at the practice and the provider and the, and the patient level. And um, it's really about looking at a sustained uptake of, of both vaccines, um, a sustained impact on vaccine acceptance, sorry, not just uptake. Um, and really, I think what I'm um, arguing for and hoping to prove is that if we can normalise vaccine discussions in pregnancy at mandated time points, become a routine part of antenatal care um, that we can really have a, a make, make a, a sustained uh, difference. But in terms of research translation and thinking about the, um, the end user and, and engaging um, everybody from the start, uh, we've already spoken to you know, our largest maternity hospital in Victoria is the Royal Women's Hospital. I've engaged the head of obstetrics, the director of maternity services and head of midwifery. I've engaged with the immunisation section from the Victorian Department of Health and vaccine policy experts within the department, as well as other vaccinologists and, and members of our team who I'll talk about later. And we are starting the discussion now about how this um, intervention will be developed and then eventually translated. So we will be conducting key informant interviews with obstetricians, midwives and, and um, key people from the Victorian Department of Health. And Katie Atwell will be leading um, a study uh, to inform the midwife intervention called the Midvax MI, Motivational Interviewing Study. Um, and this will be looking at conducting key informant interviews and focus groups in three states in Australia 
to really understand how midwives will be receptive to this intervention, how they may introduce it, are they receptive to using motivational interviewing techniques. So I'm really looking forward to the workshop and the um, after, after morning tea or after lunch. Um, and I think this study is obviously going to be keen in, in uh, informing the development of the midwife intervention. Uh, but of course, this program has been heavily um, uh, informed by uh, Saad and his team from Emory. Saad, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is conducting um, a very similar trial called the P3 Plus trial, originally the P3 trial, which they've now moved into the second phase. And um, he's been really essential to helping us, to, for us to, to build on, on his learnings and what they're doing um, in Georgia and Denver. And as I've mentioned before, the other key players that we're engaging with, but also I've convened a national meeting for all of many of the key uh, researchers in Australia in a month's time to talk about this program so that we can get their input from the start and work out how the pilot study can be rolled out into a national trial and what that may look like, um, even early on at this stage. And the other key group that I've engaged is the digital health team at our research institute, the Murdoch Children's. They have been really key in advising us how they're going to help us to develop these interventions, um, including the, the parent app, the webinars, the videos and so on that will be used. Um, and all of this work, of course, is, is also engaging with and being informed by the SKY program that Nina uh, presented yesterday and many of you are familiar with from Julie presenting last year, Julie Leesk, who leads the program. And the resources and the, and the work that's gone into that program around um, the communication approach and the communication strategies will also be used to inform what we develop in the mum bub vax intervention. So it's really a huge collaborative effort. Um, and I think, again, that is really the best way we can develop an effective intervention and uh, translate it effectively without such a long lead time. So in looking at the patient or, uh, level interventions, we are going to be developing a parent app that um, will be introduced to parents in pregnancy and on the app will be maternal vaccine resources, decision aids, some of the resources that we've developed through the SKY program on the common concerns about childhood vaccines. Um, and uh, then the obstetrician intervention will be an adapted version of VaxChat, which Saad and his team have developed for which is essentially they've got it as a one hour webinar we're planning to have it as about a 20 30 minute webinar linked to continuing continuing medical education or cme points for obstetricians and again this is going to be um, giving obstetricians the tools to be able to communicate with mothers who are hesitant about maternal vaccination um, and to give them key points about the current maternal vaccines and really to keep a focus on the diseases that the vaccines are trying to prevent. And I think this is really key now because there are a number of maternal vaccines in the pipeline. So we're not just going to be talking about flu and pertussis. We're going to be talking about RSV, group B strep. It's going to get harder and harder to convince mums to accept a vaccine in pregnancy. And we need to be having an approach that now that that uh, providers feel comfortable with to be able to discuss these vaccines and to know what to say to mothers. In terms of the midwife intervention, as I said, the study that Katie Atwell will be leading um, in terms of uh, doing the focus groups with midwives and engaging with them and understanding how they might deliver such an intervention, we're conceiving about it at the moment as um, MI training essentially, which most likely will be an online webinar that they watch and then some face-to-face -face training sessions with role modelling and observation and feedback, which Anna outlined yesterday, is really key to the uptake and the um, you know, effectiveness of MI. It can't just be you know, a couple of hours and off you go. And the, the challenge for us here is going to be we know we can't do pure MI training. It's so intensive. We certainly, I don't believe, could do a five-day program of, uh, over many weeks in this setting for midwives. So the challenge for us is going to be to work out what we can do that will equip them with the skills to be able to have effective conversations with mothers but is not too labour intensive in terms of training and funding and feasibility and scalability. So th there's a lot of work that obviously needs to happen here in the next 12 months. And then of course I think this is just as important, this is coming back again to the, the, the practice level interventions but the structural levers and we all know that 
you know, the, the communication, the resources is vital, but we have to have the provision of vaccines on site for mums in antenatal settings. And that may seem like a no brainer, but it's not happening in Australia. I mean, our biggest maternity hospital, as I said in Victoria, the Royal Women's Hospital, does not have maternal vaccines on site for the mothers. So even if they get a recommendation to have a whooping cough or flu vaccine, they've then got to go back to the GP and get the vaccine. And if they've got other kids or whatever, it's just not happening um, to the degree that we would like it to be happening certainly with flu vaccine. Um, and of course, looking at the, the, the efficacy of standing orders and uh, electronic um, medical record reminders on practice software and some of these structural levers that can interact with the other components of the intervention. And I just thought I'd highlight this paper that I became aware of very recently, this um, published in Paediatrics, a study in New Zealand that basically showed that mothers who were exposed to negative messaging in pregnancy had a much lower vaccine uptake in the, with their infants after delivery um, compared to, and, and mothers who had no messaging or positive messaging had the same um, uh, likelihood of vaccine uptake post delivery. And I, you know, initially on, on, on first reading of the paper, it's quite depressing. It's like, okay, so if we do nothing, it's the same as doing something, but if they get a negative message, we're in trouble. So uh, the way I interpret that is we've got to get in early with positive messaging. You know, we, we've got to stop the negative messages getting into uh, being about available to mums and influencing their behaviour. And as I said, that's why I believe these conversations and, and, and this intervention needs to be rolled out in pregnancy and we need to try and have these conversations early and more than once to counteract the negative messaging. But clearly we also need those structural levers. We need the vaccine on site. We need to make it easier for mums to have the vaccine themselves. Um, so it's, it's, it's very complicated. Um, Obviously, you know, if this mum bub vax intervention is effective, um, it could be scaled up and translated nationally in Australia and, of course, internationally. And that's obviously what Saad and his team are also looking at. Their intervention for the provider is different. They're very much targeting just obstetricians. I, um, we are really, I believe, this is far more about targeting midwives in the antenatal setting in Australia. So there are differences, but the theory behind it is obviously very similar. So I think what I'd really like to leave you with is that um, we need strong partnerships with academics, um, national and international collaboration. Um, government needs to be, everyone needs to be engaged early and informing the development of interventions. I think that hopefully will improve the likelihood of them being effective and, and for us to get adequate funding and then of course to be able to scale them up and translate them into practice. So there's a huge number of people involved in this program. I'd particularly like to acknowledge Katie and Jess Kaufman, um, and of course Saad, Julie Leesk, um, and Saad's team in um, Atlanta, who I had the pleasure of engaging with um, uh, about a month ago when I attended the US vaccine um, competence meeting that Saad led. And then of course the Sarah Sky team, particularly Julie and Nina, um, and we have um, uh, some other fantastic international collaborators. We have a very strong advisory group through the, the Sky team. And I think everyone will be informing the development of this pregnancy intervention um, and will be trialling them both. So Sky is very much looking at training primary care providers, GPs, um, to discuss childhood vaccines. And this is really targeting pregnancy um, and hopefully the programs will work together in the long run is, is my hope. So thanks very much.